This is Mark Regan from Disability Law Center. You're watching the Medicaid waiver training, and this is Section K on notices. Notices are things that you get from SDS in several different contexts. For example, if you're trying to get into the waiver system and they say, well, you don't meet level of care criteria for the Medicaid IDD waiver, then you'll get a notice about that that explains things to you. A common set of notices are notices about what goes into your waiver service plan. So you might ask for uh, 15 hours per week of day habilitation. They might want to give you only eight hours per week of day habilitation. So you would ask, the care coordinator would submit a request, and then you would get a notice saying, we're going to grant your request, but only in part. And so when you get a notice, you then have the opportunity to read through the notice, figure out what it means, and decide whether to appeal. In fact, the most important thing about a notice is whether it gives you enough information so that you can decide what to do. Sometimes you might want to say, well, I'm sorry about this, but there doesn't seem to be a good reason to appeal, and so I'll take what the notice says I can get. Other times, you look at the notice and you say, well, that doesn't seem right. So I want to test out doing an appeal. In order to make that decision, you need some basic information about what's going on, what the legal rule is that they're using and trying to apply, what the facts are. Those things need to go into the notice. Let's suppose that a young woman has gotten onto the IDD waiver. Um, she likes to ride her bicycle around Fairbanks. Uh, she likes to tell stories to people about her family back in a village outside Kotzebue. Those are things that she likes to do. So as part of the person-centered planning that she's involved with, uh, she and her care coordinator and her relatives decide that they're going to request day habilitation that covers a couple of things. One thing is that she would like some training in telling stories to groups about things that happened in her village outside Kotzebue. That's one thing. Another thing is she would like, uh, or actually the people looking out for her welfare would like, uh, she would like to have some bicycle safety training because riding her bicycle around Fairbanks is sometimes a little bit dangerous experience for her. And so they would like for her to have some bicycle safety training that fits together with day habilitation. So that's what she would like and that's what the care coordinator would have requested. But the legal standards that SDS uses on a case like this would be, if you're going to ask for more than say 12 hours of day habilitation per week, you need to justify that in terms of your health, your safety, or uh, keeping you out of an institution. So let's suppose those are the standards, the care coordinator has put in the request, and the notice comes out. And the notice says, in this hypothetical situation, um, you have asked for these two things, and we have decided that you have not shown us enough information to justify giving you either bicycle safety classes or uh, hours of assistance with telling your stories about your village. So we are turning you down. You don't get more than 12 hours per week of day habilitation. So that's the notice. If you have a chance to look at the written materials we have connected with this training, you'll see some other notices that uh, tell people things about whether or not amendments to their waiver services plan have been approved. So you might look at those at the same time as you're listening to this. So let's take our hypothetical situation, the one where the notice says you are asking for bicycle safety training and you were asking for uh, assistance in telling stories about your village. And we are turning you down because you haven't given us enough information to justify either one of those kinds of training. Let's suppose also that they've shown you in their notice, they've told you about the regulation that they're using to make their decision. Is that good enough notice? One thing you need to do, and sometimes you don't do it right away, you get into the appeal and then you decide that there's something wrong with the notice. But one thing you need to do when you see a notice 
is to decide whether it gives you enough information to appeal or not. And the problem with the notice I've just been talking about is all it says is you haven't given us enough information to justify uh, the two kinds of services that you want in your waiver service plan. And a notice that simply tells you no without explaining it is probably not good notice because uh, if that's all the notice says to you, then the problem is that doesn't tell you what to put together in the way of a case for purposes of appeal. Our advice would be if you have a notice that doesn't say very much, that gives you the information that you need in order to appeal, probably the best thing to do is to appeal and then to raise the problem with the notice as you are raising the appeal. Because sometimes uh, the system will decide that if you have a bad notice, they ought to think about their decision again or do it over. And so if you're confused about what the notice means, then you might want to appeal, raise the bad notice as an issue in the appeal, and maybe they will take another look and make a better decision uh, the second time around. Now, I've just been saying that they need to give you enough information in the notice so that you can decide whether or not to appeal. Here is a part of the story that we lawyers probably have gotten wrong. Um, we had this issue in some waiver termination cases. Uh, our friends at Northern Justice Project uh, had this issue about 10 years ago. And the issue was what needed to go into a termination or reduction of services notice in one of the waiver programs. And we said, you need enough information to tell you whether or not to appeal. Now, that program was making its decision on the basis of two 30-page computer-generated documents called consumer uh, assistance tools. And those CAT documents were part of how they made a decision. So the Alaska Supreme Court decided that the way to make sure you had enough information so you could decide whether or not to appeal was to include a lengthy written explanation of why they were making their decision, plus the first consumer assessment tool, plus the second consumer assessment tool. So what we lawyers managed to get was instead of a fairly short decision explaining what they were doing, we got people uh, having to read 70 pages of paper to figure out what their legal rights were. It's better to have too much information than too little information. If you are having trouble figuring out what a decision with a lot of paperwork means, whether or not to appeal, uh, that is something to talk about with your care coordinator because the care coordinator can help explain how the system works and will give you a little bit more information than you already have about whether something is worth appealing or not. This is Mark Regan. This has been Section K of the Medicaid Waiver Training on Notices. The next section will be Section L on the Appeals Process.